So our next speaker is Dr. Kim Lures from the USDA, and she has she's a strawberry breeder for USDA. She's based at Beltsville, and she was with us last year, if you remember. Um, but she's back this year to share some more with us. So Kim, you can go ahead and share your screen. Yes, I am from Beltsville, Maryland. My research fields are in Beltsville. I am primarily a strawberry breeder. And yet I'm going to talk to you about a few things because like you in growing strawberries for the breeding program, I faced some challenges in production and in labor management. So one of my favorite things to do when I discover some little trick that makes life easier, I like to share it. First of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our most recent strawberry cultivar releases. You're unmuted. Uh, our two most recent cultivars that we released are Flavor Fest and Keepsake. Gordon, thank you for mentioning Flavor Fest. Uh, both of them are mid season cultivars. And I will encourage people to try multiple cultivars uh, just because you never know if a cultivar is going to do well on your farm, even if it didn't do well on somebody else's, or vice versa. You know, don't. Uh, don't assume that a cultivar is going to do really well for you and then buy six acres of plants. Just try things out. If it's, it's your first time trying a cultivar, just go start small. Anyway, both mid-season uh, cultivars, both have large fruit, both are rain tolerant, which we learned in the last four years of spring rains. Both have low field rot, and I say that because we do not use any fungicides at all in the breeding. We want them to die if they are susceptible. Both are resistant to anthracnose fruit rot that Gordon mentioned. <clears throat> so what's the difference? Flavorfest is old enough that we were able to test it against red steel, and it is resistant to race A3. Uh, Keepsake has not been tested. I don't know if it's resistant or not. Uh, red steel doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as it used to be for some reason. So I'm hoping that that doesn't hurt anybody. Both have really great flavor, though I will say my favorite is keepsake. It's the only one that I will sit and eat after a day of tasting strawberries. Both have high yield. Statistically, they're the same but I will tell you that Flavor Fest edges out Keepsake every year and Keepsake produces fewer crowns in the fall than Flavor Fest does if you plant them at the same time. So it may be possible that if you plant Keepsake a little earlier than you're used to, or perhaps use a light row cover on it in the fall that you may get higher yields. I haven't tested that out, so I'm just suggesting it as a maybe because I know you all like to experiment, experiment too. Keepsake has a beautiful classic fruit shape, whereas Flavor Fest appears sort of overstuffed. So a new cultivar that has just that we've just released this year, in spite of all the challenges of the year, is for growers who have come to me and said, I need a late season cultivar that has large fruit because I want to grow it on matted row, though this one was developed on plasticulture. So it's fine on plasticulture. And they've said to me they need one that is firm and tough because apparently there are some out there that are not that are late season. So this one caught our attention and we called it cordial as in friendly because it has good flavor even in the rain. So if you have overcast conditions where strawberries tend to not produce as much sugar, this one has a slightly higher pH, so it's not really tart. Like Early Glow has lots of sugar, but if it doesn't produce that sugar because of all the rain, it can kind of bite you. So it's unfriendly, but Cordial is friendly. Um, an extra kicker is that it has extremely high yield, statistically even higher than Flavor Fest, but definitely higher. And uh, those large fruit keep their size, even as the season progresses. Like keepsake, it has a very low post-harvest rot or degradation, so it's got a really good shelf life. And like Flavor Fest and Keepsake both, it has low field rot without fungicides, 
it's resistant to anthracnose fruit rot, and it also is rain tolerant. In fact, the reason this one caught my attention was because of that picture in the top right, which was a harvest on a rainy day, and all the buckets had been sitting out in the rain, but that fruit even looked dry. I have also been breeding day neutrals. I don't have a new cultivar out in day neutrals, but this was a selection that caught my attention. It had twice, more than twice the yield of Albion, which is I think the standard in this area now. And it was very firm. A lot of people say, oh, you can't have firm berries in the heat, but this one was firm all year long or all summer long. I, I just harvested the first uh, what, six months of it. And it's very juicy and nice dark red juice. And it has a fruit punch flavor and it always tastes good. And it has a cute little calyx on top. So this is kind of the direction I'm heading, except, you know, I want all berries to be perfect. In developing the day neutrals, I had to develop a, a new production system, though it wasn't really new. I just had to adapt it for my needs. And uh, low tunnel strawberry production. I started, my first year was 2011, and since then, uh, I think lots of people have been working with low tunnels, including Gordon and Kathy Demchek. And um, we, we think it has some potential. Uh, I, I used it to try to breed day neutral strawberries. I thought it would be great to extend the fruiting season up to nine months, because when you extend a fruiting season that long, it reduces risk for the grower. But I found in 2016 through 19 that it also protects from the excessive rain we got during those periods. Uh, results from studies around the country show that the low tunnels pay for the extra costs, even in the first year of planting, definitely in the second year of the first planting. And then since some of the materials like the steel, which are some of the more expensive materials are reusable, then you, you're definitely looking at profits in future years. Part of the reason for that is that the fruit season extends out beyond the typical May, June season when there are higher prices. This is a nationwide average. So I'm sure you're getting higher prices than these. And these are farm gate values. So the concept is tunnels are closed with the sides down. So they're like mini greenhouses in the cold times of the year and up in the summer. And my staff didn't want to have anything to do with this when I first talked with them about it because they didn't want to be raising and lowering the tunnels uh, during the variable weather that we get in the spring and the fall. So I developed a system that allows me to raise the tunnel sides twice a year and lower them twice a year only and the rest of the time they just deal with the variability in the weather. We start in February by working the ground, making the beds. We put two rows of trickle in because these strawberries are totally dependent on you for being watered. They're not getting the rain from above. We use white mulch to carry them through in the hot summer. It's a little cooler in the bed. And I like to put straw between the beds for weed control, erosion control, anthracnose, and just a nicer place to work. We plant in March if we can. Some years we can't, and we've even gotten into early April, but we lose yield if we do that. We use bare root dormant day neutral varieties, and we space them 12 to 15 inches apart in the row and 14 inches between the row. So that's just outside the 12 inch spacing of the triple lines. Choice of cultivar, the standard people like to plant now is Albion and it performed very well for me too. Monterey is the other cultivar that I use as a reference cultivar in my breeding. Uh, Portola yielded very well, but it had uh, kind of a, it rotted a lot and it had no flavor so nobody wanted to pick it. So Monterey and Albion are the two I use. Most growers prefer Albion. Monterey has some trouble overwintering so I would start mostly with Albion and then try some Monterey because you never know. And go ahead and try Portola too. Those high yields 
You never know, your soil may bring out the flavor. And yes, you can bear root, you can tractor plant bare root strawberries. This is my crew working on it one year. I've also experimented with different plastics over the top because they are available. Uh, Kathy has two and, and uh, she and I kind of work together figuring this out. Um, there's a, a kind of plastic that the industry calls standard clear. And then there are uh, infrared blocking uh, plastics like cool light and temp cool. And there are infrared diffusing plastics that are supposed to be good for, for um, kind of keeping the plants warm in cold months. And turns out they do. So ideally, if you could have uh, the IR blocking plastics in the hot months and the um, IR diffusing plastics in the cold months, you would give your strawberries everything that they wanted, but we have to make a choice rather than having two plastics. So during the cold years of 16 through 19, I think the test film did best, but last summer, uh, the uh, cool light definitely did best. And I'm using cool light now in the future. Uh, some management tips. I start with five pounds of nitrogen a week after planting, but I reduce to two pounds a week after planting. Otherwise, I start to see problems in the plants like calcium deficiency symptoms or soft fruit, small fruit, too many crowns. Um, we remove flower stalks and runners in the new planting uh, until it's established, like early to late May, somewhere in there, it depends on the year. I wanna make sure I stop a month before the 1st of July because I have, July 1st is when I really start to fruit. Um, you may have to harvest more in the heat. I think you could harvest every day, frankly. Uh, I have to harvest every other day. Well, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then there's the weekend when it's really hot. Uh, when it's really hot, it's nice to be able to briefly cool the beds at sunset. I have an automated watering system that allows me to do that really easily, but you could hand, I mean, you could turn on the water manually. Cooling the bed really helps keep the plants um, under a critical temperature threshold. Uh, if you're going to water deeply, do it only after you're, you've harvested to avoid mucor, which is this awful mold in the picture on the right. You can, when it gets cooler in the fall, you can use row covers overnight, but be careful not to trap humidity in there because I learned accidentally that's a really good way to get botrytis to grow, which is not a good thing. The kinds of, of um, yielding pattern that you can expect Remember, you're planting in the spring. Sometimes I see a little fruit in June. Uh, it really comes on um, very high quality fruit in July. In the cooler years, it just increases to August and September, and then it drops off October, November, December. In 2014, the black bar, it, it was really hot that summer, and I was also using a kind of IR blocking plastic that was really not good. It was temp cool. Um, in the later years, like 16 and 17, I was using cool light. So I definitely um, prefer the cool light. But look at the kinds of yields you get in May, the following year. It's, it's the same as what you could expect from open June bearing types. So if you have two fields going, you can add together the yield that you get in June, uh, in the first year of planting, and in June the second, year, in the second year of planting from a different planting, and you've got a respectable yield coming out of your fields in May, June, through September, and it's really nice. The quality in November and December gets really sweet. So again, you've uh, you've come to the fall, and it's time now to think about lowering the sides of the tunnels. And you choose days that are 70 degrees Fahrenheit 
less than that as a high for, for several days in a row, not just the first one, because you can expect with the sides down, the temperature is going to be about 20 degrees warmer and 90 is too hot for them. And that's a good time to, if you can, shoot straw over the top. It falls off the tunnels. You've got the sides down, so it doesn't make a mess. It keeps the strawberries clean. You just shoot the straw over the top and it makes a, a much nicer working environment. Plus it continues to manage erosion, diseases, weeds. And then for overwintering, when you've decided you're, you don't wanna go out there and harvest anymore, it's too cold, maybe right after Christmas or maybe even sooner. For me, it's the month of January. You raise the sides back up and the plants go dormant for a while, but you can make it longer if you want. Frost protection in the fall and in the spring can be just with overhead sprinklers, even with the plastic over the top. Really surprised me that it would work, but it works just as well as if they were all getting wet. So um, it, I thought that, that's, that it had to get the plants wet to work, but it doesn't. So you've got the sides up in the spring or, in the early spring, I've done this as early as March, and boy, that's crazy, but but it works with the sides down and later in April when you know you'd be frost protecting outdoors or in in without tunnels, um, it works just with the sides up. Um, I'm a big one for for efficiency. I know I'm skipping into a new topic here, but I said I would share things that I learned that made my life easier. This year was challenging for everybody. For me, a couple of my challenges were that we weren't allowed to hire any summer help and my, my technician retired after many years and good work together. And so I had to manage the runners and I was not going to get down on my hands with clippers, not with, not with me doing it all by myself. So I tried using a battery operated leaf blower and a battery operated string trimmer. So let's see, I can't really see the top of this, but um, when I first planted, I, I was weeding the planting holes. And I, I, um, as soon as I start, saw the runners growing, I started blowing those uh, out of the, the bed and into the row middles. See on the left, you see the little plants are nice and neat and tidy with the runners all out to the side. I, I started early and I stuck it faithfully to it once a week and it kept them under control. And then after a while, it seemed like they were kind of hard to, to blow between the plants. So that's when I started trimming. I think here the key was that it was battery powered, not gas powered. So it was weaker, gentler, and the string too also was gentler. I also learned that if you can make the plastic wet, if you do this after a rain, it, it kind of acts like a lubricant and it's less likely to cut the plastic. And of course, this all starts with making a nice firm bed with the plastic tight over the bed, at least for most of it. And it was, it was fairly easy, it was very quick. And uh, I kept a couple of batteries um, on the side, but I couldn't believe it was a better quality field than I'd seen in years with hand trimming. So that's why I wanna tell people about it. Something else that I realized would be too much work for me all by myself was pulling the straw off of our beds in the spring. We've used straw mulch for years and it makes a wonderful mulch, but just too much work. And I read recently that sometimes straw can be more expensive than row covers, like during these wet years, can't get much yield. So I decided for the first time to try row covers. And um, one of the concerns I had was I didn't have a way to store the row covers in the summer, but I learned about um, an implement called HIWER, and I'm not promoting any implement. If there's another one out there that does the same thing, great, but this is the only one I knew about. And um, the thing I liked about it is it, it rolled up the row covers onto this reel, and then you could buy big bags from the same company that sold the high work 
and put them on over the reel. The tractor sets the reel down. Then you take out a zip tie and shut it. And it's good all summer long. I, if I put it in a barn, the mice would be in it. And then I wouldn't want to use it over the strawberries because it could spread diseases that could make people sick. So this is what was important to me. So I'm trying it for the first time. And next year, I'll be able to tell you exactly how it worked. So far, I'm pleased. So I know I covered a lot of ground. Please write down my email address and phone number and call me anytime you would like, or email me anytime you'd like with questions that I don't get to answer here. But I am ready for questions now and look forward to them. So Kim, there is uh, how uh, long do you think, I know I ask you this question every year, is uh, when do you think you'll have that uh, better day neutral variety? Oh, golly. Well, this is the most promising looking one I've seen so far. Um, I'd like to try it at least another year. Kathy and I have been talking about using even less nitrogen on it. Um, it, it makes a lot of crowns and it makes a lot of runners, which is nice, but it makes a lot of crowns and I think I might be able to get it to better behave if I use less nitrogen. And that would be nice too, because anybody who grew it commercially, they would save money on fertilizer. But, um, you know, I, I'm not that confident in it yet, Gordon. <laughs> Thank you. The, um, I should say the cordial is get making its way out to nurseries, but no nursery has it available yet. They just are going to be trying it for the first time themselves this year. There's a question, Kim, about what you use to apply the straw mulch. I'm sorry. Um, I use a, um, when, when we first, well, I, I like the, oh, what do you call that thing? I, I call it the salad shooter. Somebody help me out here. What, the thing that I that I showed in the um, it in the like, spot. It looked like it, a tub grinder or a, a with yes. a yeah. That's exactly what it was. Thank you, Gordon. I I like it a lot. Um, we also have a wagon that we can pull across the field, and people can fork out the straw when we first make the beds. And uh, since it's cool, they don't, that time of year, they don't mind it so much. And then I like to blow off the extra straw that ultimately gets stuck on the beds with, with just, well, that battery operated leaf blower works really nicely before we plant. The question was, do you have a picture of it? I think you had it just in one slide. So uh, uh, if, uh, we can, uh, I don't know if you have the ability to pull it back up. See this over here, the tub grinder, as you called it. I'll tell you one thing, it helps if you have somebody who drives at a steady pace and the person who's controlling the chute up here doesn't, he's not, they're not one of these people that likes to go back and forth. If you just hold it still and drive at a steady pace, you get a nice even coating of straw over the top. And, and that can be used whether you've got just the beds or whether you've got the tunnels up too. It's also known as a bale grinder. That's, that's, thank you. That's the term. I don't know why I couldn't think of it. I like salad shoot. <laughs> Thank you. I like to adapt technologies from multiple disciplines. I was really glad to get battery operated tools that I could take to the field instead of gas operated. So much lighter and so much more pleasant to work with. Battery technologies come a long way. There was also, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Gordon. No, you go ahead. 
There's also a question in the chat just generally about the economics of, um, I guess, strawberry production in general. Um, but Kim, do you have any uh, thoughts on the economics of the, the tunnel system that you're talking about? Okay. Um, so uh, you should know that there are kits available for the low tunnels. Um, Agri Innovation sells, uh, I forget what they market them as, but they sell low tunnel kits. Um, one of the reasons we in the Mid-Atlantic have lower prices for steel is because, well, we're near Pennsylvania, which is steel country, born in Pittsburgh. Anyway, um, people in other parts of the country don't have the inexpensive steel, but um, the, the uh, sales rep from Agri-Innovation, Eric Menard and I got together and his steel was more expensive because he was in Canada, but his plastic was cheaper. So the cost of the low tunnels from scratch, the way I built them, is about the same as the kit. Um, he only has the one kind of plastic unless he's expanded and it's similar to the standard clear, which should be fine. I prefer the cool light and the heat but you can get by with the standard clear as well. Um, the, like I said, the steel being the most expensive and being able to, to use it over multiple years is uh, helpful. Do take care of it, don't abuse it. I, some of the people that have worked for us are a little rough with it and they bend it and it can be bent back, but it's not as fun. Oh, I use quarter inch stainless steel, not galvanized. Galvanized will cut the plastic over the top. Three eighths inch is what I started with and it wasn't sturdy enough. Quarter inch steel is better. If you email me, I can give you an awful lot of details on how to put them together. Does that help answer the question, I guess? Uh, we also uh, can uh, give information. Uh, there, there are budgets on strawberry production, the, the standard uh, matted row and for plastic culture in the minute length berry guide. Uh, so uh, North Carolina has budgets for uh, uh, production. So if you email us, we can uh, send you links to those the materials. Yes, you're really much more of an expert on that. Thank you. Um, Kim, if you don't mind, I also jump into the the, the New Hampshire, um, which I mean, really, and you know, we got got to start with what you were doing. But um, University of New Hampshire does have a low tunnel strawberry production guide that has some economics in it. So I I guess I can just put that into the chat, the link to it, and then people could could get excellent. It if they wanted to. That Thank sounds you. good, Kathy. I'm putting in the link to the North Carolina budgets. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kim.